you know, actually not even physics, just to real life, I'm sure that uh, at some point in your life you've looked at a topographic map of, of the Earth, right? So if you have a mountain, let's say, let's say it kind of goes up, you know, real steeply or something like this, right? Then you can kind of draw a map to sort of represent that. And the way you do that, if you were to look top down at a topographic map, is basically something like this. You have these little circles, these concentric circles. And they kind of get farther apart, right? So I can't really continue drawing this one up here, but they get farther apart. And the way that you read this, if you were to look at a topographic map, is <clears throat> the following uh, representation. The closer the lines are together, right, the more rapidly the slope is actually changing of your initial object. So in this case, the highest point of the mountain is right here in the center. The lowest part of the ground is over here. Now notice that you know, the slope is not changing too fast here, so the, the spacing between the lines is much, much greater. The slope is changing a great deal up here, and so the lines are much closer together. So basically, each one of these lines is uh, sort of a line of constant uh, elevation, really is what it is. So this, this uh, line all the way around could be, you know, let's say five meters above the ground. And this one right here might be, you know, 15 meters above the ground. Um, this one might be, uh, you know, 30 meters above the ground, and this one over here might be, you know, 50 meters above the ground, and the one in there might be 100 at the top. Maybe the mountain's 100 meters tall or something like this. So you can see that each little circle kind of represents a constant altitude. If you were to get on a bicycle and drive around the periphery of this guy, the peripheral uh, perimeter, all the way around, you would be a constant 30 meters above the ground because you're going to be going around the mountain like this at this height here. And if you were to do it here, you'd be going around the mountain down here. But each case, each of these lines is drawn to be a constant elevation uh, you know, above the ground. Maybe one of these trips is kind of going around like this, and another one's kind of going around like this as you, as you kind of go around the mountain. You see what I'm saying? So what, this is going to basically be a direct analogy because, as you know, the height above ground is the same thing as talking about the gravitational potential energy of something. The different height, uh, heights that you are above the ground corresponds to the different amount of potential energy that you might have, gravitational potential energy. So this is basically kind of can be viewed as a map of potential energy. Right? Even though we always talk about it just in terms of uh, distance, because that's what you care about when you're hiking above the ground, I could relabel this if I wanted to, and I could say that, you know, that this is so many joules above, so many joules, and this is so many joules, and this is so many joules, and of course, higher number as you go up, because the higher you are, the more potential energy that you have. So this is a topographic map of that. Now, to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown, the closer the lines are together, the faster it's changing. We talked about that. Higher potential energy is at the top of the mountain. Objects always want to go from high potential energy to low potential energy. So this is high potential energy, and they want to always go to low potential energy. And the uh, lines, I'm going to write this one down because this is important. The lines um, represent lines of equal potential. Make sure you understand that. I mean, if this is the Earth, then each elevation above the ground is going to be a different uh, value of potential, of uh, potential due to the uh, field there. And so this is a certain number of, uh, you know, uh, uh, value of potential. This is a different value of the potential. This is a different value of the potential, getting higher and higher each time. But it, along the line is drawn so that it, that particular line is a constant uh, as represents lines of equal potential because they're going around the same height above the ground, just like what we talked about over here. And then the final thing is that objects always move down the mountain on a path perpendicular, that's what that means, to the lines of equal potential. All right, now this is where um, potential starts to become a little bit useful. Because 
and this is something you may not have actually realized too much by looking at a topographic map, but it turns out that objects always want to go from high potential to low potential, and they always, always, always want to go perpendicular uh, to the uh, lines of equal potential. So if you take a rock and you put it up here, it's always going to want to go down the mountain. So in this representation, it's always going to cut across the values of equal potential. If I dropped it off this way, it would go directly across. You would never see a rock wanting to roll around like this, because that would mean the rock would spontaneously be going around the sides of the mountain, and of course rocks don't do that. So that's one reason why potential is useful, because if you draw a little map, and we're going to do it in a second here, if you draw a little map of the potential due to a vector field, right, like we've done here, any object is always going to want to go from the high potential to the low potential. It's always going to want to bleed off its energy and go to a lower a state of lower energy, which is what we've got going on right here, right? And so in order to do that, the trajectory it's going to take is always going to cut across these lines of equal potential because it's going to take the shortest path from the highest potential off to the lowest potential. So if you actually could draw, I mean, you can draw an electric field and you can see the field lines and you, you know that the particle is going to follow those. But if you draw the potential, then you can also see it because you can see that the guy's going to always want to cut across them. So if you think about it in terms of gravity, you'll always be in good shape. Now, if I want to draw it in terms of electric fields, which I do want to do, this is what we're going to have here. If this is your sort of your generator of your electric field, some giant ball of charge, then your electric field is going to look kind of like what we've talked about all along. A little bit weaker out here as you get farther away. But basically you have the little arrows, so it's stronger the closer you are and weaker as you get farther out. So that's just a simple uh, uh, representation. Now let me keep that there because I don't want to clutter it up. Let me draw the same exact thing again over here. Try to draw a little bit smaller. I'm going to try to draw a little bit smaller and I'll try to draw it right here. So this is a ball of charge. Okay, again, I'm still going to draw my electric field. I just don't want to clutter up that other drawing too much. So this is it, same as before. Field lines are pointing out because it's a positive charge. Of course, if you had negative charge here, the field lines would be pointing in. That's sort of the general rule. Okay, now if I were to actually have my x-ray goggles on and be able to see the lines of equal potential that were surrounding this guy, I mean you can know from symmetry that the value of the electric field is the same all the way around here because it's on the same distance away. So the force on a charged particle would also be the same and so the electric potential is always going to be the same as you move around here. So the electric potential, if I were to draw a line of equal potential, it would go all the way around like this. So this would be my topographic map, so to speak, for a charged particle. And the, the lines would be relatively close together here because the potential is changing pretty rapidly as I get farther away. But as I start to get farther away, the field drops off dramatically in its strength, and so the potential of the field you know, is going to drop off as well, and so those lines are going to get farther apart. So this is sort of your topographic map in terms of the electric field. So you've got uh, your lines of equal potential. If you orbit all the way around here, you should have the same number of volts, which is your potential, the electric potential of the field itself. There's no particle I've put in here anywhere. I'm just saying this is the potential uh, per unit, a potential energy per unit charge, which is what we call the volt of this field here and then all around. So if I were to place a charge here, I know that it can do, uh, that it would have a potential energy that would be related to the uh, potential of the field itself. So if I were to put a charge here, like right here, then I know obviously it's going to follow the field lines, which is exactly the same thing as cutting across from a higher potential to a lower potential. So this is high potential in here, and this is lower potential. So this might, for instance, this might be 100,000 volts, let's say, up here. And then down here, this might be 10 volts. The potential difference between them is huge, right? So there's a very high difference of potential between one location in the field to the other. Particles are always going to want to go from high to low, and they're going to take the shortest path to do that, so they're going to cut directly across these lines of equal potential and zoom out that way, okay? So a couple of things I want to make sure you understand. The electric field is always perpendicular to the lines of equal potential. 
That's point number one I want you to understand. This, these gr uh, green lines are the electric field. So I'm going to write this down here. The electric field is always perpendicular to lines of equal potential. And that's just the way it is because when the field is changing like this, when the field is changing like this, the potential is going to be dropping off as well. And the lines of equal potential, uh, you know, all the way around, if the sym symmetry is like this, is going to be cutting across like that as well. So the field is always going to be cutting across uh, the lines of equal potential because the potential is falling off as we get far away as well. Uh, the second thing I want to point out, charged particles always follow the electric field, which is perpendicular to the lines of equal potential. So you can put little b here. Uh, charged particles uh, cut across lines of equal potential. Cut across the lines of equal potential. I'm going to write P-O-T as lines of equal potential. So it's the same thing. And that is exactly the same direction as the field lines. And you already learned from earlier in the course that charged particle is going to follow the field lines. If it's positive, it's going to go with the arrows. If it's a negative charge, it's going to go against the arrows. Same exact thing. This is all consistent with what we've been saying before. The third thing is the higher potential, which is over here, is going to be in areas of the stronger field. And that's because there's going to be more potential for work to be done. Okay, And the final thing is the closer the equal potential lines are, the more rapidly the potential energy changes and the stronger the electric field is. This is actually really important, so I'm going to write this down. Uh, the closer the um, equal potential is what we call it. The closer the equal potential lines are... Um, the more rapidly the potential changes, the more rapidly the potential changes. Think about it. If this is like 100,000 volts, 90,000 volts, 80,000 volts, and as it spaces out, I mean, it's changing much more rapidly here. The more rapidly the potential changes, changes. And the stronger the electric field is, I'm going to put a little arrow here, the stronger the electric field is. So basically we're going to have an equation that's going to encompass C all by itself here in just a little bit. And basically that's going to tell you in math terms what I've written here in words. The closer these things are together, it means the more rapidly, the higher the rate of change the uh, potential is actually uh, uh, happening there. So the faster the potential is changing, the bigger your electric field is. Now, if you think about that long enough, you might think about that. What is usually related to rate of change in terms of math? What we're saying is the rate of change of this potential gives you, when it's bigger, it gives you a higher electric field strength. So when you think rate of change, you should be thinking derivative. Right? And so that's what we're going to learn here and just on the next board is basically that the rate of change or the derivative of this electric potential is directly proportional to the strength of the electric field.